Welcome to Collector's Corner, the premier digital art platform. We help collectors gain and maintain their edge, all while appreciating beautiful art. Let's jump in. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Collector's Corner. And today we have a fantastic Into the Collection episode. My name is P. You may know me online as at Aston Cloud. I'm joined by my co-host, Jared, who you may know online at, at Jared underscore pause and by our good friend and fantastic artist james merrill who you may know online as at to the pixel jared how are you doing today i'm doing awesome I had lots of outdoor time with the boys and my wife so i'm all energized uh, i told you i got my uh, lion's mane tea i just consumed so cognitively I'm, I'm performing at my best man that's right and the three-piece suit is looking sharp as well oh best dressed, the best web three baby that's right. James, how are you, man? Hey, I'm doing really well. I've been looking forward to chatting with you guys a while after we all met in Marfa and just really excited to be here. Yeah, yeah. Likewise. I mean, I feel like we we could have recorded that conversation and that would have been a fantastic podcast. Uh, but there's so much more to talk about. Ori has been released. It's doing fantastic. And the market's turning around. There's a lot of excitement going on. So we're happy to have you also because this is such a cool project as you're explaining it to us. And I think the listeners are really going to enjoy it. I know uh, Jared and I certainly do. It's like so nuanced and, and interesting. I feel like very different from what we normally see. So super excited for that. Uh, and super excited to share with everybody about your life and what, you know, all the amazing things you've accomplished. So like, it, it's going to be a super fun episode tiny bit of house cleaning. So for folks listening, this is a video episode. Check it out on YouTube. If you're not able to, we have a DECA gallery that we put together. Um, both James as well uh, contributed some really awesome pieces here curated to that we're going to talk through. So take a look at that and uh, otherwise try to get over to the video whenever you can. And also we are uh, really pushing on our newsletter. So check that out on our Twitter profile at collectors underscore XYZ to help you stay up to date with all gen art, including when James's new stuff is going to come out, which hopefully we'll hear a little bit about what, what you're working on. But yeah, James, so just to start off, I'd like to hear sort of how you, maybe just start with like your entrance into art or your relationship with art growing up and, and how that evolved kind of leading up to Ori. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess to rewind back to the very beginning, um, it was around 2003, 2004. I got really fascinated with flash animations online and I was on newgrounds.com and just really thought it was cool that people were able to by themselves make cartoons and games and that sort of thing. So I got it in my head that I really wanted to do that. And I was in uh, New York with my mom shopping uh which isn't my favorite thing to do but we were walking around and you know i was kind of twiddling my thumbs being bored and uh saw this street vendor who had a flash mx 2004 book on his table and i was like oh that's pretty interesting so i started talking up with him and seeing like is there like a demo cd in this book or whatever and he basically was like well if you want the program like reached under the table and pulled out this like black uh box and it had all this software in it that certainly was not legitimate but i was able to purchase a copy of flash for like 20 bucks from them and i uh brought it home and that was like the beginning of it all really for me because i've always been interested in artwork but i've always always been interested in computers too i didn't know how to like marry that up necessarily until i got this program and what was really interesting about it is it was a vector drawing program so I was able to practice illustration and get into that sort of thing. And that really took me on a trajectory to getting involved in different digital art communities and putting things out for a number of years. But it also was useful for building websites. So I was like, I want to make my own website for my artwork. So then Flash helped me out because I could write code and deploy it like in very old school ways to the web. So I started my own website and I put my artwork there and just started getting involved in the digital art community from that point onward. And for years, I would do art, like put out a piece every single day and nothing spectacular necessarily, but just exercising these muscles and trying things. And then once I did Flash for a while, I was like, well, now I want to learn Photoshop and Illustrator and 3 Studio Max and fluid simulations and photorealistic rendering. So throughout my career of art, it's always been for me, at least about just the personal enjoyment of trying things. And it's led me down various different paths. So if you look in my portfolio, 
don't expect to necessarily see a lot of generative art, although there has been a lot in the last couple of years. My art career has taken me in all these different places. And for a while, I was doing like, you know, 3D simulation short films. So you'll see an era of that. And before that, I was doing a lot of the stuff you see behind me, which is like, you know, digital illustration that's very abstract that I was compositing with like various different programs like Corel Painter, et cetera. So, you know, for me, it's all about just the enjoyment of creating digital techniques. And that's landed me where I'm at now. So you had a, you were, I call it natively digital. How did it then transition for you into maybe that, uh, that web three gen art? Uh, Was there a natural transition for you? And what did that look like? Yeah, it was interesting. So it really started because, you know, I was a member of all these digital art groups, including Deathcore. And Deathcore has some of the, you know, world-class artists, including people like Rick, who currently dropped with Proof. I think he did like one of the single-digit mints, but really, really amazing work. And Justin Mahler, who is another really awesome Web3 artist who's doing like facets right now. So when 2000. 21 came along it was you know kind of a shock right like i remember february hearing about like the whole nft thing and it was all starting to go down and i didn't know like heads from tails of what was happening but i knew that people i really respected were putting out amazing art on the blockchain and i was just really fascinated by that and it kind of like brought new wind into the sails to this digital art community that had frankly become a little dormant and I knew I wanted to be a part of it. So, you know, Justin and Depthcore, they really helped me out with just understanding like the components of how to launch collections and that sort of thing. Making the art was definitely the easy part. It was understanding how NFTs work and how to like, you know, deploy them in trustworthy places and all that kind of stuff that I needed help with. And from there, um, you know, I got involved in doing some one-of-ones on Foundation, which, again, I mean, it's pretty seamless. And uh, doing some drops on Nifty Gateway, which is uh, really fun to try to, like, you know, deal with all these different artists, that sort of thing. So were you, prior to getting on your art onto the blockchain, were you selling any art, any of your digital art? So I was... Um, in a way, yeah. So I was doing a lot of plotter art and I was selling that. So that was kind of like, you know, a form of income, but not necessarily one that I could sustain uh, a professional artistic career on. But I had experience, you know, understanding the market a little bit, seeing what's out there, making art and then selling it. So, yeah. Got it. Awesome. And, and now you are an Artblocks curated artist. How does, how does that feel? It's pretty wild. Um, I also recently like changed careers to just be a professional artist because of that. So it feels really amazing. It feels honestly a little scary at times, but I've been thinking a lot recently about risk and the necessity of doing risky things while you have time to do it. And this is the time to do it for me. So well, I can't say I'm necessarily going to be successful forever doing it. I'm going to give it my best shot. And, you know, I'm leaving a career that I had a good, you know, a good run in and was very successful, but I really feel like this is my calling and I would be doing myself a disservice by not pursuing it. You know, I, you can definitely tell in talking with you, the amount of attention and I'll call it pride that you take in your art. Uh, to recap some of the stuff that I, I became very enamored with you before even the release of Ori, just going through some of the the test outputs. And then we, we had the fortune of meeting you prior to Ori in Marfa. Can you recap some of the the details maybe and give our listenership some some insight into the amount of, I'll call it, attention to detail that you put into this thing? Um, I, I know that specifically what I'm hinting at is when you spoke about how you studied certain, like I'll call it dynamics and how those then integrated into code. I, I just found this incredibly fascinating. Yeah, I think uh, it really already started for me. I started, I mean, I love generative art and part of being in the software development field is, you know, reviewing other code, doing pull requests, that sort of thing. So 
I started reviewing other gen art projects out there to just decompose them and understand how they work because it's always just so fascinating to me. So when I was building Ori, that kind of influenced how I thought about it. So being very uh, precise about what is random, what's not random, what's assumed, what's connected, what's completely disconnected. And examples of that are things like there's no true ultimate randomness in Ori beyond maybe like the green pattern. Everything else is weighted in a sense. So it's like a lot of levers, a lot of knobs, a lot of things that I've tuned in over time so that my outputs generally look aesthetically pleasing to me. So I created essentially a system to look at Ori in a way where it could be thousands of individual outputs, quickly review them, understand where outliers were, both good and bad, and then tune them in. And this was definitely the hardest part of the project because it's not as simple as just writing the code and deploying it. It's writing an iteration, studying it, figuring out on a macro level what little things went right and what didn't go right. And then how do you tune that in so that maybe you don't take a heavy hand and destroy your best pieces trying to fix your worst pieces. And that was probably one of the harder things I've ever done in my artistic career, honestly, but I built solutions for it. So my background in software software development allowed me to kind of build a curation utility, a way to generate batch outputs, that sort of thing. And I did all that because when I was building Ori, I was really thinking about generative systems and stacking them up. So I think this is kind of maybe what you were touching on as well. And that you don't, for me at least, see the most emergent outputs from algorithms that do a single generative thing. When you can layer systems on top of one another, that's when it gets really interesting and the results get far more robust and potentially exponentially so. So what I mean by that is with Ori, you know, you kind of have this paper folding algorithm and that's where it all starts. And that I've tuned, but I've tuned it so there's different ways to fold that paper and the shape of the paper is different. So all of that exponentially creates different results. And then when that's done, I've created a rendering engine. It's kind of a whole different can of worms, right? It's like a spray paint simulator. And because of that like layered cake approach, you get radically different results with really all the same components, just assembled in different ways, doing different things. Yeah, that's super interesting. So like, as you've gotten further into the community, do other artists do this? Kind of create the, the system that helps them uh, with, with the curation, the way that you described it, almost like a meta system? Yeah, I think so. The, the, the bummer is no one is really out, like open sourced it necessarily because i think for me at least it's very mvp but i think harvey has one of these and tyler has one of these like it's really like i need to review a thousand jpegs like what's the best way to do that well, what, do, what do you mean by review i want to rate them okay cool now i'm rating them how do i do that as quickly po- as possible you know, i just want to press a key to do that real quick and there's no like out of the box solution to do that that i'm aware of that would have worked for me and that's the case with a lot of generative art projects. And I think it, it definitely, you can tell a difference between the artists who have systems and don't. Because by the time you do a long-form generative art project, you may have looked at 10, 20, 30,000 outputs. I mean, I've heard people talk about 100,000 outputs. It's, it's wild, right? And I actually wonder if it's good for your brain to look at that much visual information. It kind of could drive you a little crazy, to be frank. But Building solutions to make that as easy as possible, I mean, I think you got to do it. Otherwise, you're just going to limit your opportunities to find those outliers and exploit them for benefit. No, that makes sense. And and that efficiency, of course, is kind of baked into the mindset of of an engineer. So uh, it's, I'm sure, something that you feel compelled to do, especially with that kind of volume. And just uh, what, one other question on the background on Ori, because I, I really enjoyed hearing about this when we met in Marfa. You were mentioning how, you know, the, the basic concept of Ori is around uh, folding planes, uh, meaning like a, a linear, not a linear, but like a flat plane. And it, it, I think you said it took you something like 11 months to even learn some of the math that it took to, to figure out how to program it. Could you talk about that process a little bit? Like, what was your intention in terms of uh, the folding and how you wanted to manifest that and what it took to get to the point where you could do it uh, so brilliantly the way you did with Ori? 
Yeah, absolutely. So the whole project took 11 months. The paper folding algorithm came first. And it, it didn't take 11 months to get to that point. I actually thought that Ori looked, like I went back and looked, and some of the outputs in the first like two months kind of looked almost like production outputs, but just not quite. But I'll give you a little more backstory. And that's the, um, you know, I'm a high school dropout. I failed Algebra 1 like two or three times. Couldn't stand it. And math has always been like the bane of my existence. And I can distinctly remember asking my math teacher, why am I learning this? I'm never going to use it in real life. And everyone chuckling and all that. And that's like the, the biggest irony in my life because obviously I use math all the time now. And the thing with it with me is that because I'm not formally educated in it, it's really hard for me to understand how to do the basic things. And generative art has given me a reason to learn it. And it's been so just illuminating and fascinating understanding what's the value in learning how to do some of these, like, you know, do a little trigonometry or calculus, that sort of thing. Things I never would have thought I'd be able to accomplish. And again, although not fast, I've been able to kind of figure out in small chunks how to put it together to make something. And there's honestly no better feeling in the world. And that's a, a big reason why I do this sort of thing. Because personally, when I know I have a problem and I can sit down, I can channel in on it and I can solve it, like there's literally no better feeling in the world. So with Ori, I kind of conceptually knew what I wanted to do because I've always loved origami. I always loved the idea of folding. And I was like, that looks mathematical, especially if you take a model that you folded and you unfold it, you're going to see patterns. And they're really brilliant. Um, and if you look at diagrams for how to make really advanced origami, sometimes you'll just see these crazy shapes. And it's assumed that you know how to like fold it all together and make you know some kind of crazy like geometric star or whatever. So that was the inspiration. And in order to do that, I was like, okay, so what does that actually translate into? And it's like, kind of what you're saying, you have a piece of paper. So that's kind of like, four vertices because it's got four edges and then you draw a random line through it and then you fold it on that line and to figure out how to do that involved some math so figuring out really like where that fold was cutting the polygon into two pieces and then taking the vertices and like translating them through some amount of rotation and once i figured that out through a lot of trial and error and tribulations I knew that I could make something interesting. And I also realized pretty quickly that it wasn't going to look like traditional origami. And that was okay. And the reason was, is when you make a piece of origami, the resulting form is always smaller than the piece of paper, right? Like you're folding it, it's getting smaller. And with generative art and with my concept of worry, that wasn't necessarily something I wanted to have happen. So my algorithm started to change in uh, separate from maybe physical properties and paper folding because artistically it offered more opportunities. And all I did look into, you know, how do you accurately simulate folding paper? And there's like two mathematical theorems that you have to integrate to do it as well. So I just, I had a sense that going down that path wasn't going to lead me where I wanted to go. And I'm happy, honestly, that it got where it it is now because I challenged the assumptions of origami while implementing them and having, you know, good results show me that, Hey, maybe like there are rules I want to break. And that's where it really started to make a lot of sense. I think that's one of the things that I've come to love about this collection a ton. And, and we can talk more later about it, but just the, the fact that, I mean, Ori is an obvious reverence to origami, but yet it stands distinctively on its own. And just the, the sheer zoom, zoom out, but yet the the honoring of like some some sort of physical folding of it, it, it just it really is an amazing combination, especially when coupled with the palettes, uh, the outputs. Uh, it you did a phenomenal job. Uh, I'm obviously a fanboy of this. I picked it as my 2022 art blocks drop of the year, so I have a very strong bias, and my bags are are oriented towards it, but. All that joking aside, I think you did a brilliant job on executing. And it's one of the things that I love about, uh, I'll call it the generative art space is mirroring, I'll call it maybe some traditional, I'll call it tactics or abilities. And then in this digital space that allow you the flexibility and autonomy to, to really create what you want to. So brilliant execution, James, honestly, um, I, I love, love these outputs. Yeah, and I just want to say that it's it's also an amazing story. I think 
it's really inspiring to hear how you picked all this stuff up and have continued to push on it and learn it. And I'm sure that's really empowering for you as well. And so I'm really interested to see how that mindset and skill set continues to push your skills as you move forward. And maybe if we have time at the end, we can talk about more about what you're working on. But I know that you, as you mentioned earlier, you were big into plotters. So, uh, and and actually we we'll, uh, should be able to show you one of the, the folks here, one of the plotter images that you sent us because I think the plotter Ori's are, are really cool. Uh, Jared is uh, Jared is willing to trade his three-piece suit for one. I'm just kidding. <laughs> words in his I, mouth. I, I will pay up for one. My three-piece, I don't know what you're going to charge for a print, but my three-piece suits are more, I promise. <laughs> yeah, joking jokes, all jokes. So, hey, let's, let's dive into Ori. Uh, I'm super excited because this collection is phenomenal. And so for folks who are listening on audio, we're going to put the DECA gallery up on screen now, and uh, you can follow along there. We will uh, try to point out the token IDs when possible. So now for the video folks, this is our DECA gallery that uh, James helped us curate to talk through Ori. Before we go into the details, just a little bit of background. So Ori was launched on November 16th, 2022. It's 450 pieces. And it currently has 67% unique owners, which is uh, quite fantastic and uh, quite well spread, which is uh, really great. And we like to see that in collections. And we talked through the, the history of J like James's history. And we talked through the history of the collection itself and kind of how James was thinking about it. And uh, I just wanted to quickly go through our framework for collections. Like, why did, why did we choose this collection? Obviously, we really enjoy it. As Jared mentioned, he's a holder. I, I'm also a holder of Ori. And so beyond that, I mean, we think the visuals are fantastic. And, and you know, James, we like to talk about this because we like to help our listeners and as collectors think of, okay, like, what, what are the things that we should look out for fantastic collections? And uh, obviously, that's why we're doing a deep dive on this. But aesthetically, does it pass your eye test? And, uh, I, you know, Jared, I'm going to ask you this one because you, you've been talking about it off, off camera. How do, as, does Ori uh, pass your eye test? Uh, yes, of course it does. I, I love the, the complexity of, of shapes and colors. I think it's a, a brilliant combination of both. Um, and whether you're into sci-fi or origami or anything along the ways there's something that can draw you in i absolutely love uh the collection yes 100 uh, percent. and obviously we are both fans of james and then that's the second thing we look at is, is the artist i mean clearly he's uh, very talented very hard working and personable and all that uh, really matters and uh, in terms of holders I, I took a look into this uh you know you want to see who else is holding this or people whose opinion you respect uh, also collecting this and you know curated fund is 10 of these trill has seven jiva has many von mises jared uh so you know folks who tend to be really good at spotting talent and in great collections are holding this and the sentiment goes along with that as well and, and and so that's the fourth thing sentiment and then we look at the collection breadth in, in long form generative art we want to see, okay, of course the individual outputs look good, but does it fit well together as a collection? And uh, we think it really does, you know, and we'll, we'll see that as we go through it. And it's a really unique algorithm. Another thing we think about is the historic significance. Like, could this be something that is uh, kind of copied and replicated and, and start a trend? And that remains to be seen. It hasn't been long enough yet for this collection, but I certainly think it's unique and, and I haven't seen anything like it. And then the last thing is we talk about, uh, we look at the charts and we've been doing this more lately. Uh, Jared, maybe I'll throw it over to you if you want to talk through what the Ori chart looks like and what you're liking here. Yeah, the chart is something that I've been looking at for some time. And it's the reason why I'm, part of the reason why I'm very intrigued with it. When you look at the the daily listing price, I look at this as a, a future indicator of like what's to come of it. You can see that the listing price keeps setting higher lows. So it feels as though the people who maybe were in it for a short term are starting to exit. You can start to see, you know, P list off a number of holders, uh, 6529 within the last couple of weeks, just recently picked up a really, a uh, couple triptych of like really amazing pieces. So they're starting to come in and go into collections that I think will, will go long or do well for longevity. 
And the other piece that I really, really love about this from a charting perspective is one of my favorite points is the market cap versus cost basis. And you can see uh, the market cap is starting to bounce and find support off of the cost basis, which is usually a sign for a future launch pad. You can kind of see it previously on screen. And I think we're setting ourselves up for something there. Uh, who knows what the time is and if it will happen, but it's looking pretty juicy to me. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Once people are in the positive, there's a lot more positivity around the collection and, and that helps. And, you know, for the folks who are less uh, quantitatively inclined, you might say like, well, what, why are we going through this? And the reason is because this shows you what the crowd thinks about the collection, right? It shows you that, and look, if you like it, it doesn't matter, but it is just a good indicator of an aggregate, how uh, the sentiment is around the collection. So for all those reasons, James, we were super excited about this. And we picked out some of the traits here, uh, not all of them. And I know you picked out some hidden features. So if uh, there are any of these categories you want to go into, we can always hop over to, uh, you know, Sansa and take a look at them. But, uh, you know, thought we'd start with Border. And, and this one is pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, you can see here, a lot of them have a white border. And uh, on the left here, that's the number 82. And on the right here, some of them don't have a border. Uh, there are fewer without a border, only about 60. And uh, those that do not have a border hold a premium in this collection. And, you know, I, I guess I just have one question for you, James. I, I like to ask artists this. How did you think about the frequency of border versus non-border as you were creating the project? Yeah, I think, you know, speaking about the border real quick, it's not a true border in a sense that a lot of things escape it. So with Ori, a lot of it is challenging the perfection of computer-generated art. So there's a lot of free-flowing paint. There's a lot of drips. There's the line work. They all kind of flow outside the border. The border just really captures the background and foreground elements. But it doesn't really hold everything in. And I really liked that, but I also liked the idea of a more minimalist output. So I weighed it around giving enough of Ori's outputs the borderless option to, for me, feel satisfied, knowing that in general, like the border is cohesively what I want part of the story to be, right? So I wanted it to happen, but not even 50% of the time necessarily. I wanted it to be a fraction of the overall outputs. Yeah, I love how, I mean, even on the the piece that we have up on screen, you can see towards the bottom, the the and even in the center of it, the paint drips that, that seem to really ignore that border and give it like, I mean, especially seeing the, the, the artwork that is behind you, it kind of feels native to your style. And I have to be honest, it's not something that I had noticed previously. And so just pulling those two together, it feels kind of natural in a, a, a cute little signature of yours. And I mean that in a complimentary fashion. Yeah, thank you. And a lot of that's inspired by street art. So I really love graffiti. I love the idea of just the physics and the dynamics of spray paint versus say a paintbrush. And that's where this kind of second level of worry exists is in that street art world. And obviously with my background, right? Like you can tell I've always for a long time been interested in that. And I've integrated that into many previous pieces of art along with just living in city environments, right? Like when I think of art, I oftentimes think first of graffiti just because that's what was around me growing up. Um, Maybe not so much now that I live in rural Vermont in the middle of nowhere, but that's where my roots are at. Uh, and that's part of just a callback uh, to, to that part of my life. Yeah, that that overspray quality, maybe we'll touch on it later, just as the palettes transition from one color to another is is, is something that I've absolutely like loved about the collection. It's just such a, a, a great way to tie all of the, the color transitions in. Or color mutation that's the next category that we wanted to get into um and this is actually my favorite i'll call it uh, trait within the collection the majority of the collection is none at 434 pieces and when you have no color mutation your traditional palette shows up and i think that 
that becomes evident as you're looking at it. However, when you go exclusive, which there's only 16 pieces, so they, they're clearly rare and they clearly have a premium, you then, the focal, I'll call it the, the origami pieces, become almost, at least to my eye, an exclusive color. And they, they, they have this really sharp contrast against the background. And I think that while I love the palettes you've created, these also present a, and we we're talking off camera about this, these present a, a really rare opportunity for them to pop differently. And these pieces to me stand out uh, within the collection. I think that algorithmically it's the right balance where with only 16 pieces, you can see, <laughs> I mean, you call them exclusive. They're, they almost feel exclusive now too, but I know is probably reference to the the coloration, but it, they they pop differently and they they catch your eye when you're scrolling through the collection. I think there there's something beautiful and um, uh, they're rare enough that I think they they carry premium. But at the same time, uh, it's not it doesn't feel saturated amongst the collection. Was there anything else yeah, that you is, wanted to add on this one? What what did I miss here, James? Yeah, you know, I would just say that um, this was born through experimentation. So when I was defining my color palettes, I never really thought of doing this necessarily. I always thought worry is something with a number of colors on each piece that I balanced probabilistically so that I could emphasize certain ones, make others more rare, that sort of thing. So that was always my intention. But at some point, I was like, what if I flattened that? And I actually had another color palette where it would be just white geometry in one color background. And that was like kind of cool, but I didn't necessarily love it. And I threw it out. But I always had that in the back of my head as something I wanted to do. So when I got kind of towards the end of the project, I was thinking about, well, I would like to do a little bit more here. But... As anyone who's ever launched a project on the blockchain knows, if you add more code, you pay more for gas fees, right? It's it's kind of like you want to be careful not to make these ginormous projects because maybe I could have had 50 color themes. That would have been cool. But the way Ori works is I really handpicked every single color. So it's not just like the color of the geometry. It's like the foreground color gradient. So that's two colors. The spray paint color when it's really bright, when it's really dark when it shoots out the border of the geometry. So like every single piece is the culmination of a number of different colors. And I was like trying to make sure I didn't do too many palettes for a number of reasons, including like the performance and that sort of thing. But I know I wanted something and I was like, well, what if I just added the ability to just pick one of the colors out of the list? So it's not really probabilistic anymore. I'm guaranteeing it's just one. So I played around with that and then I started to like the results because it does have something different going on. And especially on the right hand side, it almost looks like there's like a cast of pink light on the whole piece. And I really liked the results, but my uh, one issue or error with worry that I mentioned is that, you know, I probably would have allowed this to happen a little bit more had I understood how infrequent and rare these would be. So I probably would have doubled that probability if I were to do it again. And part of the reason why it was so low is because for one, it was kind of hard to test. And two, not all color palettes have this option. It's like, I think like 75% of them. So due to the way all the randomization works, the probability was lower than expected. And it's kind of fun because some of them are really like a one of one in a sense. But I feel like I could have told that story a little differently, maybe, maybe done like three or four for each. Uh, so lessons learned, but it has created only 16. And I think that is kind of like a cool part of the project because there are some ones here that are one of one. So, Yeah, I mean, jumping ahead to my three, I mean, two exclusives made it. I mean, I think it's absolutely stunning, the the outputs. And, and as a collector, I wish there were more, but as an enthusiast, I think it's going to, shine well for it uh because it, it just they like i said they hit differently in in such a good fashion yeah and, and and as a collector we also love one of ones so uh yeah it's it's interesting and i i really just you know to be honest i hadn't noticed it quite as well until now and, and for folks who are not uh watching i'm zooming in on number 330 here and i love that little like you said it looks like light is hitting it in this case orange on number 
304 over here. It's like pinkish. And that's uh, it's just a smart way to introduce some variety there, uh, which I really enjoy. Let's let, let's talk about fold strategy. This one, uh, I'm not going to lie to you, James. I sort of can tell here, but it might be better <laughs> if I don't put my foot in my mouth. And, and maybe you can talk us through how you thought about this. And and just so you know, or for the folks listening, uh, I'll, I'll shoot count out uh, how many of each of these types emerge. Foldover is the most rare with only 15. Yeah, so, all right, you've got your pack of origami. You want to make something with it. You go to your directions. It shows you how to fold things. Or like, or, or kind of works that way in a sense in that while the directions that the algorithm is following aren't always the same, they have a general relationship across all the mints that use the specific algorithms. So foldover is unique in that it folds up the geometry a little bit but there's one enormous fold that completely does a 180 on it. So you get a really hard line. So like if you took a piece of paper and you folded it in half, you'd have that hard line on the fold. Whereas in many other of the algorithms, it's like very subtle folds. So maybe it'll do a lot of folds, but they'll only ever so slightly bend the geometry in different ways. And fold over is like the extreme of that. So it kind of stands out in that you're going to get these really like aggressively folded pieces, I guess I would describe it as. Oh, yeah, I I actually, I really like these ones, uh, the the aggressively folded. One, one of them made my top three, so that makes sense. And so the next most uh, rare one is called a sequential slices. There are 29 of these. So uh, what, what is the fold, uh, or how did you conceptualize the folding in this one? Yeah, these are really interesting because all the fold lines are almost kind of in the same direction, except for one in the center. So imagine if you took a piece of paper and you horizontally folded it a number of times, uh, and then you folded it kind of in the middle once, but then you took the paper and completely stretched it out, you would get something that looks kind of like this. So you can, if you really analyze maybe the one on the left, you'll see that single line in the center basically that cuts the geometry and almost bends it a bit and i really like that effect and this might be one of my fold my favorite folding styles because you get these kind of like subtle macro level bends in it um there's also a attribute for one last fold though that can sometimes introduce that in other places however this one is like always going to have that and along with maybe that as well so Got it. Got it. So that's, yeah, that's beautiful. I love it. And I love how it combines with the, some of the geometries, which, which we'll get to, of course, um, radial. So this one, there's 44 of them. Yeah. So radial is if you took your piece of paper and you folded it, turned it a bit, folded it again. And if you did that all the, you know, 360 degrees, you'd have kind of like a circle with a bunch of folds that create the sides of it and that's what this is meant to do so there's for radio at least always going to be a bunch of lines that kind of start, create a circle somewhere um and you can kind of see that in these but when i made that circle too small or too obvious i didn't necessarily like the results so i created with all of these some randomization so that the folds are never perfect they may go missing, they may fold themselves in weird ways, and they may be off a bit. So there's a circle there, but it's been distorted through randomness. However, the concept behind it remains that you kind of sequentially build them around 360 degrees. Got it. I, I really, you know, we'll, we'll get to this, but I really enjoyed a lot of the pieces that ended up having this central piece whether it was through a, a radial fold or some of the other characteristics and this one in particular I, I loved a lot this is number 94 i'm a big fan of this gum palette which we'll get to but i'll, I'll stop teasing ahead uh many little bent slices by the way i love i love the names like uh these are the, the, the no it's not is this camel case i forget but i know it's like a software engineering style of uh, of naming variables 
So I really enjoyed how you named your categories, these different things like that. Yeah, this is, so this, that is Camel Case. This is the developer name for it. It's not the public facing name necessarily. And that's like one of those things where, for me, I just wanted to get the art out there. I didn't think about like feature naming a ton. I actually had to clean it up a bit before I went to like the production name net. But some of the things kind of slipped through, and this is one of them. So this is like the name of the algorithm in the code is explicitly many little bent slices. So that's the, the story behind the name. And what this is, is kind of what I alluded to earlier, where it's a large number of fold lines, but they're all just subtly bending around. And they're not really ever doing anything super dramatic. So this almost creates a little bit of a, I would say like a flowy style in some cases. Uh, that can lead to really interesting and pleasing results. And one of the things I learned early on with Worry is minus that fold over algorithm, like if you make really radical bends all over the place, then the results aren't always great. So I had to like really curate these and tune them in because sometimes it would be like too much of a good thing and it would take it and it would like radically warp it. And I don't know if I loved that necessarily. I wanted something that created the effect but it was subtler, and that's kind of where this one was born. Got it. And 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 where I guess like as I'm looking at this between these two on the screen here on on the right side, is it just where kind of on, along these lines is where all the little subtle bends are? Yeah. So the bends are represented by those lines, and those lines are kind of a call out to origami diagrams, which oftentimes the instructions are shown in a way that shows like all right you need to fold this way or that way maybe in front or behind based on the the line work and i really loved that so that's another tie back to origami and you're right so those lines actually aren't just there for fun they affect the uh artwork so they are what is being folded so every time you see one that's a line that went through that geometry and folded it in some way or another and the really fun thing about it is they do that to themselves. So like if lines intersect, then the bend on that second line will manipulate and alter the trajectory of the first line where it was folded. So as you layer them in, they start to become less coherent because they're all folding one another. And if you look all those intersections with those lines, that's where the geometry is cut too. So that's how you get that multi-color effect is the folds are actually influencing that and they line up. So you can kind of trace that fold and what it did. We'll talk about some math that happens in some pieces where it challenges that and warps it and changes it. But where we're looking right now, you can see all the lines kind of line up pretty well. Got it. And, and every time you have a fold, it exposes potentially a different color, like the back yes. of the paper, for example. Got it. Yep. Oh, this is super cool. Okay, awesome. Uh, then small, small shears. What what was this folding strategy? Yeah, so there's a practice that's kind of adjacent to origami called kirigami. And that is when you're not just folding paper, but you're also cutting it. So you might cut out shapes or move them. And what this does is it, in a sense, when that fold happens, it'll actually take the two resulting pieces of geometry and reposition them as if they were cut and realigned to a sense. Now, if you do that at an extreme level, you could cut something and completely break it apart. But with this one, it just very subtly does that. It does that over the course of all the fold lines. So what you get is like slightly distorted geometry that doesn't line up as much as anything else. So if you look at both of these examples, there's areas where the polygons have been shifted in a sense and almost cut in half, especially on the left-hand side. If you look at those top circles, they're like sheared in a sense. And that's what this one is responsible for. Got it. Yeah. And uh, having a little bit of trouble zooming in here for some reason, but I, I see what you mean. The the ovals here are cut in different places and that's where that it was a smaller shear for that. Perhaps a little bit more difficult to tell in this one on the right because it's complex. Um, but uh, okay, that makes a ton of sense. And equal big skew. So here, uh, yeah, I mean, these ones are, are quite a bit different. And so how how were you thinking about this one? Yeah, so this is that to the extreme where 
really big skews happen. So when that kirigami cutting effect occurs, the uh, distance that the paper can travel, say left or right or up or down or whatever, is much larger. So the distortion effect is more pronounced. And I like these as well because these kind of take that original geometry and it'll blow it off. So the one on the left, I know that's like a geo pack, but there's really no coherence between each little piece of, say, paper geometry because they're just like completely shattered in a sense. And there was a part of the story that I wanted to tell with Ori that had that, but it wasn't the whole thing, right? So that's where instead of just doing one paper folding algorithm, I was like, how many different ways could you fold paper? Like, could you shear it a little bit or a lot? Or in a lot of these, it's the fold lines stop, they terminate. They're not kind of like a vector that's infinite. They're a set uh, size. And if you look very, very closely, the little tiny like X's and circles and squares, et cetera, that's where those lines terminate. And if they terminate, they're not going to affect geometry they're not touching. And that leads to different results as well. So on many of these, that's a variation I play with. Like, are those fold lines infinite? Are they really small? Are they larger? And they all change the geometry in different ways when you introduce that. Yeah, this is super interesting. And I'll, I'll take a moment to say to the listeners, I mean, this is what is part of uh, the beautiful part of, of the long form generative art and generative art in general. Um, but particularly in long form is you can take a few primitives, but allow them a lot of flexibility. So you get a, a ton of variation from just a few things. And, and not that you have more than just a few in Ori, but it's typically a few of these traits that really drive a lot of the visual variety that you end up seeing. Yeah, and these, this and the next one, even though they're more quote unquote common, I just love how they impact the algorithm and then the adjacency of color. I, I really do from a folding strategy perspective. I love the fact that these come out the way that they have. I mean, it's absolutely stunning. I also think, and I guess I'll say this once, but I think that Ori will thrive more when the, the displays it become advanced enough to, to, to show it properly. I think this is one that, I mean, as, it's exemplified even further as we're doing this, but as P zooms in, you get to see this detail within the the pieces that I don't think are blatantly out, uh, apparent when when looking on on your your phone, right? I mean, the, these pieces are just so so detailed and so brilliant the way it all kind of comes together. Yeah, yeah, Jerry, yeah. thank you for that. And I, I kind of feel like. You know, I do photography on the side and I'm totally that guy that like zooms into a hundred percent to check the detail on everything. And I wanted to do that with Ori. So like, you know, was it a good use of my time to take those little termination points on the lines and figure out 10 different ways to represent them? I have no idea, but I really love that. It's like, I never want to do something once for an algorithm. I want to do it eight different ways and then find the best or maybe do a mix of all of them. And that's an example of that. Um, yeah, I, think I will say that, too. That's why we do these is to tease out this sort of, I'll call it artist intent. And then the attention to detail that as people are perusing may not become very apparent. And and it became very evident to P and I in talking with you that the amount of passion and pride and and value you're trying to bring to, to your collectorship is, is just overwhelmingly apparent. So uh, we appreciate it. Thank you for that. I was just going to mention too. So this is the web version of Ori, but for prints, I'm going to give people two options. One, you could have just this. This takes about five to 10 seconds to render on your machine. It has millions of little particles for the spray paint simulation. But if you want, I will sell you a print where I've taken that and I've taken it to an order of magnitude more detail where it takes like a minute to render and there's hundreds of millions of little tiny particles. And when and the te test prints I've made and I've looked at, at a very, very close detail, you'll get that same effect, even though the print is now, you know, a 24 by 36 or something like that. So that detail level is really important to me. It's not always the story that like, you know, when you're looking at a phone, you're going to notice. But for the people who take the time, I really want to reward that. And that's why for prints, I'm emphasizing that as an option as well. That's amazing. I I love that. And 
I can't wait to see what that looks like, honestly. Uh, and you know, it, hopefully if we have enough time at the end, we can, we can show off some of your plotter prints too. Will, will you have those as options? Oh yeah. Or is a, a multi discipline thing that has, yeah, like the digital version, an animated version. So we could talk about that plots and prints all in kind of the portfolio of this project. Oh, that's amazing. And I, I feel like, you know, I, I got my first prints ever recently and I'm waiting to get them put up on the wall. So the interactivity is just, I think only going to increase with collectors. Um, so let, let's head over to geometry because there's, this one is super interesting and I, I'm really excited to talk through this one with you. Um, I'll, I'll kick it off and then hand it over to Jared, but uh, Mega Pack, there are 18 of these and uh, these ones hold a pretty significant premium. And uh, yeah, what, maybe you could just talk at a high level about what geometry is and, and how that is different than fold strategy and then uh, explain how those apply to Mega Pack. Sure, this is so, these are like kind of when you think about that analogy of the layers of the cake, these are two systems that are not connected but informed by one another. Um, so you could apply any geometry to any fold strategy and vice versa. And what geometry is, it's kind of like the shape of that originating piece of paper. So it could be, say, a square piece of paper or a circular piece of paper or many pieces of paper. And that was a lot of fun to play with because you could feed it a number of different possibilities. And for the creation of the project, I certainly tried a number of different things, including like spirals and twisty lines and all this stuff and landed on my favorites. And that's what was ultimately released. And with uh, a lot of this, I started with like a basic circle packing algorithm. So if you've ever seen one of those, it's where you have some area and you put as many circles as humanly possible in them and the computer calculates it. And that's actually what creates this uh, geometry. But what's really interesting is instead of circles, I use squares. And when you do that, the squares will never touch one another except for at their points. So if you think about a square inside of a circle, like the squares can kind of never touch each other really, um, except for on their edges. And there are some ways I challenge that with this. But there's kind of a, a couple of different of these geometries that are related. And Mega Pack is related to another one that we'll talk about in a minute. But with this one, I emphasized like one kind of really big piece of geometry and then filled in the gaps with much smaller ones everywhere else and creates a very interesting effect that when I saw it for the first time, I was like, this needs to go to, to production. I really love it. So that's ultimately where this came from. So the, the mega pack then has this uh, circle packing with squares, but does the algor if I'm hearing you correctly, does the algorithm then allow for some of these mega squares to kind of infiltrate the the visual piece and impact kind of the the adjacency and just even the the amount of area it takes up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like basically instead of having one key algorithm, it's understanding that algorithm deeply and then tweaking the parameters and then offering that in different ways. So shipping it where with Mega Pack. I kind of plop down some big circles to start and then fill in all those gaps. And then with uh, Geopack, they're all kind of more evenly distributed. And I liked both, you know, but for me, this was kind of interesting, but not as diverse as say the other ones. And that's why it's such a low priority. So the, the next trait that we wanted to review was six pack. Is that other than reference to somebody's abs, is there... <laughs> Is is there a, how does that control? And is, is the six important in this? So this one is kind of a evolution of the geo pack, but it has something that's akin to a, a circle as opposed to a square more. Um, so all the pieces of geometry have more points associated with them. Uh, so, so that's kind of hexagon? Where is it a hexagon yes. instead of square? Uh, there's the six. Yeah. Okay, yeah, they, these ones are are pretty cool. I like the ones that are up on the screen too, because you can see the the clear hexagon uh, shape, and then just even the the radiating nature of it. 
the there's almost an elongation on that one on the right the the blue is absolutely stunning kind of got like a moon type quality uh next up is my favorite uh other than exclusive which is you know both p and i own it and 6529 just picked them up but is the flock category or trait I, I absolutely love this. It, it does remind me of like a flock of birds, but do you want to explain kind of how that influences things? Yeah, absolutely. So this is actually like with my art, I like to add hints back to uh, the parts of generative art that have inspired me and little like things that I've discovered along the way that were like mind blowing at the time. And one of the things that you'll find is in a lot of examples, including like P5JS, there's like this flocking algorithm that people will write where, where it's like all these little tiny rectangles and they'll usually follow your mouse and they'll like follow it like a flock of pigeons. So they won't like collide, but they'll kind of coalesce and fly like a murmuration. And I just loved those examples. And I, I've seen them over the years done in like flash and then P5 and processing and all these different things. And it's almost like when people do generative art or interactive art, this is one of the fundamentals. And I just wanted to kind of like pay some respect to that with this algorithm. And then as I did it, I realized they kind of display this sense of movement, especially uh, the one on the right, right? Like they kind of change their angle, even though those triangles, when they first start off, they're kind of pointed in the same direction. The folding may take them and twist them and reposition them. And once I struck that, I was like, yeah, this is, this is something I want to really pursue and add. Yeah, so for clarity, the, these, from a, a geometry perspective, are all triangles, is my observation. And what I find really interesting about these is uh, they, they some of them come out to look like paper airplanes, which we'll touch on probably a little bit later. And I just think that the way the, the folding of the triangles impacts it is really impressive. I, you know, we have 253 up on the screen on the right, and I think that's exactly what you're talking about, is the folding line takes this um you know triangle and it, i mean just bends the noses or the bodies of it in, in such a way that it it uh it 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 dilutes it in a way that's actually very engaging and it, it really bends it in a way that's makes you do a double take because it's not necessarily native to it but it is in, in maybe in that geometric uh folding area so i don't know i i, I love these there are 26 of them they carry a pretty substantial premium from the floor right now. Very, very well embraced uh, from the community. I absolutely adore these. They're they're amazing. And to transition into the next one, which is writer. That being said, I have no idea about this one. So I would love any input that you have on this. Yeah. These are two like wild examples of writers, by the way. Not maybe the ones that I would like call out to make this point, but a uh, writer is really a, like trying to capture some of the flowy line work that you see in graffiti. So you'll oftentimes see swooping lines and angular lines and that sort of thing. And writer kind of is my attempt at bringing that to worry to again, lean into that street art graffiti style that I wanted to capture in this. These are very interesting because they're highly deformed by the fold lines. And some writers, it's very apparent that that's what they are. And others, like, I don't think it'd be easy to pick up, especially the one on the, I mean, honestly, both of them. But the one on the left, it's so caught up with that Kirigami work that it's its own thing at that point. Yeah, these are, there's some really, really cool geometries that come out of this. There's like elongated pieces and uh, I appreciate that detail because that's something I would have never, uh, never gone to automatically. The next one that I I actually love this one a lot too. It's called the uh, circle array. And I mean, as the name implies, one of the the controlling geometries here is a circle, and it's an array. I, I love the way some of these came out, honestly, and and just the variety amongst them because of all the the folding strategies makes it really really engaging. Yeah, thank you. Um, this one, I guess, kind of to call it out again, has more of a programmer name. <laughs> and that was not necessarily uh, thought about much, but you're right. And this is one of those things where 
I'm always laying out all these circles and like their sizing may change, their positioning may change, the number may change, but there's not a ton of variety in what you get. It's the folding algorithm that distorts them and makes their makes there be a bunch of different variety here. And I liked that. And I think, you know, if you uh, think back to the first image we looked at, that was a circle array too, but those weren't really distorted in any way. And sometimes that simplicity is really nice. And that's why I, I really loved this sort of geometry. Yeah, the, the the one that's on screen is absolutely, I actually just looked up the owner to see if I could get it. it, it it's absolutely combines, I think, a lot of different ideas and I'll call it intent of your algorithm, just with the the paint dripping, the the cuts within the circles, the the fold lines changing. I mean, it's it's a really really cool piece. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll I'll jump on that bandwagon. That one is awesome. Yeah, I uh, I think of a pizza. It makes me think of a pizza. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what pizza you're eating with that color pepperonis, man. But you you may want to take it out of your <laughs> fridge and throw it away. Theoretical pizza. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the next trait is three circles, which to me, my eye, it's it's more circle. It's circle based still, but maybe more focused. Yeah, um, a insightful person would note that there are more than three circles on these. <laughs> which, whoops, uh, they started as three circles. So I wanted to position ultimately three circles of different proportions in a relationship and or you stay like that for a really long time and then at some point i was like i wonder if there's a small chance that there'll be more than three uh did not update the name necessarily and i think that's okay it's kind of cool but these are ultimately always going to have this very kind of fluid smooth curve to them. And I wanted to do that in contrast to many of the other pieces in Ori that are highly angular. I didn't want Ori to always look like that. I didn't necessarily want people to just see shattered glass when they looked at Ori. And that's why I wanted to make sure I emphasized certain ways to just create curves. And this is that at its max level. Awesome. Yeah, and then the next trait is Geopack, which we kind of touched on earlier. Um, anything you wanted to emphasize on this one? You know, this is really just, uh, it's the idea of many little pieces of paper. So think of Post-it notes maybe. Um, and having that be what the geometry is and playing with it. And these are kind of fun because they can be really zoomed in or they can be zoomed out. And they're really versatile and you get these really interesting patterns with this. So I had a lot of fun tweaking this one out um, and really trying to figure out like what the right balance was. Uh, and you can see here that it leads just a lot of different variety. Yeah, there's a huge variety amongst this trait. Uh, I mean, you can see it on the screen and, and across the collection. There are 106 of them. So there's a lot of, a lot of variety to go through. And, the last one in this overall category of geometry is double square. This I actually have to say, while the most common, and I'm using finger quotes, at 149 pieces, it actually ends up having some of the ones that I really, really enjoy most because of this uh, intimacy amongst the the colors because you get more of a, I won't call it zoomed in, but you, you get the colors are a little bit more prominent, at least from my observation. Yeah, you actually bring up a good point we haven't talked about yet, and that's that not all types of geometry can be mapped to all types of folding algorithms. So sometimes maybe like with a flock, it might not be able to be combined with, say, the seven or eight different um, folding algorithms that exist. But double square is one of those ones where it's really versatile. And this is as much as it could be as close to having just a single piece of paper or two pieces of paper that are butted up against one another in more of a square format and letting that be very, very, very simple and not show you what's happening. It's more about what the folding does for you. And that's why you get kind of that larger macro level transitions and the bigger colors, that sort of thing. Because it's not like a mega amount of detail presented at the very beginning, like maybe a geopack would be which is by definition going to have maybe tens or even hundreds of little tiny pieces of paper this is like what if you just had one 
Yeah, no, the, the way this comes out, I mean, there's some that are just really, really have this prominent feel and they're in your face, but in such a, just a color blast and fun way. It, it's an awesome, awesome, I'll call it piece of the algorithm. And now that we've gone into to depth about the the geometry, which I, I absolutely love, it, it's, it's, it shows the, the breadth of the algorithm. We'll transition into palettes with the first palette up being uh, probably one of my favorites, which is Briss. And I absolutely love this one because it just pops off of the background. I mean, the blue that you chose, you know, it's this very vibrant, but light blue. And when partnered with uh, the reds and the yellow, I mean, I, I definitely think that this is a crowd favorite. It, it, while it is not necessarily the most rare with 42 pieces, it is definitely one of the more collected. So th this is a absolutely amazing execution on color. Yeah, and I'll, I'll jump in here really quickly as well. This is one of my favorite palettes, probably my second favorite one. I remember when we were looking at the test outputs, my eye instantly caught to this one. And I, you know, it's it's funny. We'll get to it. I have a little short segment after we go through all these categories on the uh, what is undervalued. This is spoken of really high, highly, but it's not really, uh, it doesn't have much of a premium. So it's, it's an interesting one. And I thought James, uh, I could just kind of go through some of our favorite palettes. And if there are any other ones you want to highlight, I'm sure you love all of them, but uh, you know, Briss was one of them. And for folks who are just listening, Exodus, this was by far my favorite. It, it reminded me a lot of the Bauhaus palette from screens, which I also really enjoyed. And, and, just at some point, none of these were for sale, uh, but they are now for sale, some of them, and they also sell for a premium. And then I wanted to highlight also the screen time palette. Uh, just love these greens and the way it mixes with the, the grays and the darker purples, perhaps, that don't even know the best way to describe this color, but kind of like a futuristic sci-fi feel, which I thought was amazing. Uh, the Dove palette also trades at a premium, uh, kind of soft, really love these, uh, the combination of the blues and the tans and the pinks there. The Zest palette, another one where you just have this fantastic green in here that I just don't see that frequently. Uh, it's just a big fan of that. And, and I mentioned this one earlier, the, the Gum palette, which is, uh, yeah, just, just the way that the pinks and the purples meld, uh, particularly in the dark backgrounds, it's just beautiful. So those are some of the ones that that we liked, and uh, you know, James. If there are any others you want to highlight, uh, we can of course also show it on OpenSea. But I'll just pause there and hear any reactions you have. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I really appreciate it, and I think uh, a lot of the color theory behind Ori was, for one, emphasizing contrast. So I found that low contrast Ori's just they didn't sell it to me. Like I didn't love it, so I really wanted to experiment with really in your face changes between foreground and background and even geometry as it's put it up against one another and after i defined a couple palettes it was definitely a continuous effort of chucking some out tweaking some keeping some and challenging my assumptions about what kind of palettes where you should have so if you look at ones like uh screen time that one's very unique because almost all of the geometry is the same fill color but it's the borders that change color and there's really only one pop color, and that's that kind of green. So I wanted to challenge that there. And then when you look at gum, this is one of the earlier ones, actually. I wanted something that was really vibrant but didn't have a lot of different colors. So it's more of purple, pink, and a little mm. bit of blue. But with each color, I left the option of whether it should be oversprayed is what I called it. And that's where the spray paint and the glow appears where it kind of takes that and it blasts it outward. And with uh, gum in particular, that's turned up a lot. So these really have a lot of glow element, more so than any of the other palettes. Coincidentally, they also take the longest to render because that's hard to compute. But these ones, if you like that effect, are where you want to go because especially on that right-hand side, there's so many of those pieces of geometry that have that blowout effect. And I'll say uh, for what it's worth, like if I had to choose one color palette I really liked the most, I think it'd actually be the Skull palette. That one's kind of unusual too. Uh, lots of reds in that, some 
some oranges and golds and that sort of thing, but also purple. And I really like came into loving purple and you'll see that a lot in Ori. But Skull is this weird combination of all the different uh, colors mentioned. And it just stands out to me in a sense of just unusual, but also really contrasty and beautiful. All right. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, James, you were talking about the, the Skull palette. Yes, the so Skull is really interesting because to me, it has a great combination of colors that are really contrasty and they're unusual color combinations. And so this is where I really came to just love purple, right? So if you look at it, it's kind of weird that there's purple in there, but to me, that's one of my favorite parts about it. And, and it's cool that you brought this page up because the exclusified version of Skull is all purple, which again is just a reaction to, to my love of the color that I've kind of found through working through Ori. Yeah, those those exclusives on the Skull are just, the, the purple pops and it just hits so, so well. It, it's absolutely stunning. Um, the final category that we're going to go through today before talking about some secret stuff that you shared and P's going to share with the, the listenership and I'm super excited about is reversion level. Do you mind just giving maybe a, a global review of of reversion level and maybe how it affects the, the outputs? Yeah, so this is uh, born through a glitch. So I was trying to do something with some math and it didn't work and the result was cooler than what I was trying to do. And what I was trying to do is an important, but what a reversion, which is a made up term I made up is, is really when you almost take a magnifying glass to the geometry and it zooms it in based on proximity to a point that's on the canvas. Well, if you feed it negative numbers, you get what you see here, which is a negative reversion, which actually kind of like uh, makes it more distant appearing, but it's incredibly subtle. And due to this glitch, the fold lines may not actually line up with the geometry shading and positioning. And it, it breaks it out of that, which is kind of cool. So I played with this effect a lot. You could make it very, very extreme and it almost like twist everything around. But I wanted different levels of it for different purposes. So negative minimal is it's there. You could find it if you really looked for it, but it's not so much. And then there's other ones where I do that, like maybe I have multiple points that are zooming or creating distance on the geometry as well. Got it. Amazing. Like just just again, like Jared was saying earlier, the level of depth is fantastic in the way you thought about all of these traits. And I got to ask you about this one over here because this one really caught my eye. Uh, I don't know if this was all due to the reversion level. Uh, this is a reversion level none for people as things number 259. How did this one get so colorful? Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's like a happy accident. Um, the random number generator will giveth and taketh away. And this one just kind of happened to have a lot of those less uh, common colors appear. And we got lucky on it. And that's the case with some things where it's just like chance occurrences that lead to cool results. And you just, that's the funnest part about generative art is because you can't make that happen all the time. But when it does happen, that's where like the really fun stuff occurs. Yeah, this one I've had my eye on for some time. It's actually for sale right now. I think it's absolutely beautiful. And it takes that almost street artist approach with all the overspray and the contrasting colors. I mean, it's cool to hear you say this is one of those unintended outputs because we always uh, try to to dig deep enough into the algorithm and the artist's thoughts to to hear this. But I mean, it's stunning and like really, really beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I may have to revise my top three, Jared. I'm like <laughs> taking a closer look at some of these. Um, amazing, awesome, James. Well, so you were you were kind enough to bring up some hidden traits. And uh, I put them here in the gallery, and I, I also have your your Notion document. Um, and the first one here that you mentioned is uh, visual vertices with Ori number 27 on the left. And uh, so you're saying some of these mints have uh, the geometry exposed or outlined. Is that, is that what we're seeing here? I think you had it zoomed in right here. Are these the, these little dots here? Yeah, so I guess I'll say real quick too, like, why not expose all traits? You could, and many do, but I wanted to reward people who do that 
pixel peeping and they're like really looking closely. And I didn't want to like tell everybody everything about Ori. I wanted to create a little, little bit of mystery around it. And some things fell into that category and other things weren't necessarily worth exposing. Like, I don't know that this would influence anyone necessarily to buy or not buy a piece, but I just wanted as much diversity as possible. So with this one, all of the paper, all of the polygons are all vertices. And I added a very subtle little dot to show you where they're at. So the best way to see them is on anything with a curve, because curves have a lot of vertices, whereas, say, a rectangle only has four. And if you look, you can see those little tiny dots there in a sequence, and that's what I'm talking about. Got it. It's so fun. And I love that you bake these into the algorithm, or at least you didn't expose them, I should say, because... I think it's just fantastic for collectors to do as well. And uh, over here on on the right is is another example of that. So you can have folks uh, come and, and zoom in and and take a look at at some of that. Uh, and then the next one here that you had mentioned were no fold lines. Uh, are those those the the dashes that? Well, no, actually, I'll, I'll let you I'll let you go ahead and tell us. Yeah. So this one, I definitely added in as a reward because it's pretty rare to get a piece like this and you might not notice what's different at first but if you look for more than a couple seconds or contrast it to another ori piece there's no of those distinctive fold lines all you're seeing is the geometry and to me it makes it significantly more minimal and it's a little bit more mysterious as to like why this geometry is shaped the way it is so typically in ori the fold lines kind of show you, all right, like this went through there. I can see the continuation of it across all the geometry. But on these, you don't see that. So you don't really know. And I thought that was really cool. But, you know, with Ori, those fold lines are something that's very distinctive to this project. It's something that I felt strong I wanted to have most of the time, right? So this is, I think, like a one in 50 chance to actually get one of these. So there's not many. And I really love that. And I, I really actually resonate with the one on the left a lot, although I love both of these. Because when you remove that, like it's like addition through subtraction and these kind of stand out to me. Yeah, no, this this is amazing. And actually, it's it's funny. There's some folks that I've spoken with who for screens, bringing up that example again, uh, they don't like the ones with the splotches or the the little kind of dots that are sometimes on the canvas there. They like the cleaner look. And this is a, amazing easter egg because of that i mean some people feel very strongly about that some people don't but the point is one in 50 uh you know J jared's jared's taking notes i can i can't see him but i but i know it <laughs> no, i i uh what's ironic is the one on the the right we were talking about before clicking record so um you know that's definitely one that's i that has a tremendously high eye appeal right right and uh this is actually a variation of that. These these next two here, uh, it's the fold lines happening behind the geometry, right? So that's also really cool here. You can see right here on the screen, there's a line here on the left that's starting, but then it gets uh, kind of absorbed with the folds, unlike most of them. How uh, how rare or frequent is this hidden trait? So this is uh, more rare. <laughs> I don't know exactly what the percentage is. I can look it up, but. This is one of those things where in developing the algorithm, I went back and forth. Like I like the fold lines both ways, in front of the geometry and behind it. So the fun thing about being a generative artist and making something like this is you can have both and you can even control how often it happens. So this is just one of those things where I really liked it, maybe not all the time. So I introduced it in relationship to those other two. So you either see all the fold lines, which is typical, they're behind the geometry, which is atypical, and they don't exist, which is extremely rare. Got it. Yeah, I, I love it. I love it. And then the next one that you had highlighted here was that there are, it's a, uh, here on the left, I'm showing it, um, that there are different zooms, right? That there are different options for how close or how far away from the shape you are. And you mentioned uh, when, when, in your document that there are eight different levels of zoom uh, are some like more or less rare than others or, or the super close ones or the super far out ones more rare or how did you think about that 
So this one wasn't about rarity necessarily. It's more of the necessity of not everything looked good at the same uniform zoom level. And many of the fold strategies actually didn't look good if they were really zoomed in or really zoomed out. But across the whole spectrum of different combinations, I could see a case for all of them. So when building Ori, the way I built it is I kind of set not just the probability of all these things um, together. It was more of like a package of like, there's a one in five chance you'll get this package and the package contains the geometry, the fold style and the zoom level, a couple of other things too. But I did it that way because I didn't want complete uniform randomness and ultimately in generative art, like that's not usually what you want. You want something that is like, maybe has a relationship to other things and they work cohesively together. So with Ori, the zoom levels are there, but they're more of a complement to really emphasize the right things about the right geometry and fold strategies. So I don't think of them like, oh, there's like this really rare one or really common one necessarily. It's like they're custom made to fit what's happening on the canvas. But in order to do that across this broad spectrum of different combinations, I needed a lot of different ways to zoom in. So some are really close and you'll look at some Ori's where it's almost all geometry that you see and there's almost no background. And then there are some where it's a lot of background and the geometry is very much centered in the canvas and it's far away. And I love them all. And it's really like an, built out of the need to capture that across the spectrum of the collection. Amazing. I love it. And that makes sense. And we'll, we'll let the listeners find some of those, uh, I, I I get what you're saying though. It, it doesn't. It, it's more of a, a pairing than necessarily like a, a, a rarity type of thing, which makes sense. Or grouping, I should say, not just a pairing. And this one was a null color probability. So you said that there are three levels of strength when it comes to the chance of the geometry omitting its backfill. Uh, so it may completely omit the backfill, omit some of it, or or sorry, omit none of it, some of it, or a lot of it. Which one is this here? that we're seeing on the screen. Yeah, so there's a lot of pattern work across worry. So again, it's like each little piece of paper, it's not just a color. It's got like a spray paint color, a background color, it's a gradient. And there's line work across all of it. So if you look really, really closely, there's actually different patterns that you'll see. And sometimes it's horizontal lines, sometimes it's more of like this leaf pattern, sometimes it's like a shatter pattern. Um, and then there's like dots and stuff. So you can kind of see it there, right? Like those very subtle blue lines and stuff. That's a big part of the algorithm that you don't really see that much. And I wanted to play with the idea of, well, what if that's all you saw? And there's different levels of that where you might lose that kind of backing color a lot, some of the time or none of the time. And they all kind of, to me, speak out in different ways. but that was really cool for me when the geometry folds over itself. So when you kind of have a back piece of geometry and then something else that overlaps it, and it just so happens to have this null color thing where it's like transparent kind of, the line work will just overflow over it, right? Like you can't usually tell an Ori when things overlap necessarily, but when this uh, is there, you can totally see right through it. And all you're seeing is like the pattern work. And that's, it's not something I expose. But if you look closely, like some won't have any of this and some will have more than others. And sometimes pieces like the biggest part of the geometry will actually be like an all color. And I was looking at one earlier today and I was like, why is that so off center? And it was like one of those things where I was looking at it on my phone. And then when I looked at it on my desktop, I was like, oh, because it is kind of centered. But a lot of it you can't really see because it's very fine pattern work. And it took all the stuff that was really contrasty and pushed it in the upper right. And that's just one of those things that you can't rely on that happening. But when it does, it creates these interesting, unique uh, mints. So, Yeah, that one's actually one that I, had, I wanted to talk to you about. Because it looks like there's almost these like transparent patterns. And then sometimes you fill them in with this line work like you talk about. Other ones, I mean, I own uh, Ori number 69. And there's just this like, I loved it because it's brisk. It's got this like bold thing. And then there's just like this big blank panel that... Like it, like you said, when you look at it, it almost feels off center. But you then you you can visualize it, and it, it brings it back to to center. I, I think that it's a fun 
trait because it almost like knocks out pieces of the pattern that that show a, a brilliant preview to it, but also maybe are are not immediate when you think about the the patterning. So I, I love that that part of the algorithm. Yeah, it's beautiful. I, I I noticed some of the patterning earlier, and I really I, I've enjoyed that a lot in a lot of generative art. So I'm glad you incorporated it because I think it definitely brings another dynamic and is very pleasing to the eye. The 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 last couple that I, I won't belabor in the interest of time is uh, you have different backgrounds, colors, uh, or unusual backgrounds for different pieces that are often distinct from their tradition, let's say that the norm for that palette. So on the left here, we have an Exodus palette that doesn't have any of that bright yellow that you just just saw in the the last piece above here which is also an exodus palette and so we'll we'll let the listeners hunt for this one uh as i mentioned in the sake of time but i love that you did that james i think uh, again you know it's actually something that i've thought about a lot and we are trying to work on over here at collector's corner is trying to make it easier for people to organize and find these types of things uh, we did this with memories of chilin as well so really applaud you for the thought in the uh, engaging collectors and, and kind of rewarding those who kind of look around for those Easter eggs. But let's, let's jump over to the three that you wanted to highlight. Uh, and, and I think we've seen a couple of these, but I'd love to hear why you chose these three. Yeah. So I think probably a lot of artists say this, but it's like impossible to choose three. These are the three I was really feeling today. I have my short list. It's probably like 10 or 15 that just like really appeal to me. And these are the ones that are just like, they're on that. I think about a lot, I have a print of the one on the right. I've already mentioned that one a couple of times. So for me, like the one on the left is really interesting because it has kind of like this upward swoop. So I see some movement in it and it's got this really big purple piece of geometry that's pushing it over that gives it that movement as well. Um, so I just really looking like kind of stepping back and looking at it, love the fact that you see that. And then in the middle one, it's a really good example of like, it looks kind of like a square, but it's so distorted. And that's what I wanted to play with when I was looking at Kirigami and subtle shearing and that sort of thing. So it's like, I could see maybe where it started from, but what you have now is like a very complex piece of art that has a lot of fine detail. And it's also got some curve work. So although I said like, hey, it looks like a square, it's got curves, it's got pieces, they work together. And it really stood out um, to me, at least for that reason. And then finally, on the right, it's a very rare piece because it doesn't have fold lines. It has those visual vertices and it doesn't look like the other art in the collection, in my opinion, for those reasons. But, you know, it's got just that the, the spray of the paint, um, and I can talk a little bit about that, that there's a, a lot of different spray paint simulations that happen in Ori, and they're different sizes in different places. So there's kind of like this overall spray that happens at the end where it's like the biggest pieces of paint or the biggest strips of paint, they kind of splatter out radially, uh, radially, excuse me, and they have movement to them. So sometimes they'll kind of hit the canvas and slide a bit. And this one kind of has that with red and yellow paint coming from the left-hand side. And it's just really contrasted nicely against that dark kind of gray-blue to bring it all together. And this is another one where it's really kind of, it's got curves, it has movement, um, and it's just, to me, a different way to look at the project that I didn't really see in a lot of other pieces, and that's why it stood out. Yeah, this one is just unbelievable i hadn't really appreciated it until this recording so yeah i i, I don't even have anything, anything to say i'll I'll just i'll hand it over to jared to go over the three he wanted to highlight okay, the first one on the left is number 305 and this one is exclusive it's the um amused palette but i just thought that this one was amazing because the white pieces pop off the blue background in such a beautiful way uh, I, I mentioned earlier also some of my favorite pieces are that mega big skews when you kind of have that more bold in your face look and you know this to me was just absolutely beautiful I mean when you zoom into this piece all the line work in that empty space on the top of the blue 
was uh was phenomenal again this is one that i could just see being presented uh on that three-story samsung display at the uh, nft nyc that we're going to make people's mind just get blown because it's it's so dynamic that it's hard to actually appreciate it but being exclusive i've, I've studied these things in in way too much detail <laughs> i'm on the hunt for one please hit me up um and then the second pick was number 287 the the owner of this might be uh, very familiar to most of the listenership i think it's an absolute beautiful integration i think this is a one of one of x in the sense that it is a flock and the exodus palette um i think the way the execution of the flock came together it just reminds me of folded airplanes this one in particular was just one that i absolutely was drawn to right out the gate um beautiful beautiful piece and the the contrasting colors of those uh triangles from the flock against the background um it just it pops brilliantly i absolutely am enamored with this piece um if i only knew the owner the uh the last one that i selected on the right here was number 373 again another exclusive and another with that mega big skews. But this is the cloak palette. And, and I know we talked earlier about the, the purple popping, which I, I absolutely love. But this one, the blue and the way it just like pops off of the, the white and black background is, is amazing. And it, it almost does it in a brilliant fashion where I don't know if this was intended or not, James, but when the, you know, the exclusive pieces hit a dark background, it pops with a little bit of a lighter blue. And then when it's being contrasted against the white, it has that darker feel. And it just, it, in some way, it reminds me of like the the Batmobile from like uh, the, the most recent ones. I mean, it's just got this like very brutal yes. like approach to it that like you could just see it have like a commanding presence. And every single time I've looked at it, I've just been drawn into it and it feels like masculine and forceful, but like in a, in a very brilliant way. So absolutely love it. Yeah, I I love those choices, and I'll I'll go and uh, share mine. The first one that I picked was number three, uh, or sorry, one eleven here on the left, and I just loved the it, it. You know what this reminded me of? I don't know if you ever played Halo. It reminded me of like one of those like sabers that the, uh, <laughs> the aliens have in, in Halo. I forget what they're called, plasma sword maybe, but it just looked so cool with this fold having that color on this background and then the you know the patterning here, the complexity of the shapes leading at you know what <laughs> what I conceptualize as the handle of the sword. I just yeah, I just it was drawn just drawn to it right off the bat. The second one I picked was this one in the middle here, which is number 376. And I just couldn't, I couldn't unsee almost like a skeleton with a top hat. Like here, it's, here's its hat, here's its eye, here it's, here's its mouth. And it just seemed like this really interesting emergent image with all of the various shapes and folds here that just, I don't know, just drew me in. I, I really enjoyed that one. And the last one I'll pick uh, is, is the same one that Jared picked, two eighty seven. This this is mine. So he's been he's been trying to get me to sell it for pennies on the dollar for for a while now. Um, to, to him, <laughs> just just kidding. He's made me reasonable offers, but I I just love this one. And you know what I like a lot about this, James, is the the yellows here in the Exodus palette almost seem like a backdrop. You know, it's almost like. I feel like uh, like in an anime scene where there's like a, a pause and there's like a, some colors or some explosion of graphics in the background to emphasize something that's happening. And then it seems like there's a bunch of these paper planes taking off like that. That's what really drew my eye. It was like it seemed like a snapshot of a, of a scene that was really interesting in the middle of motion. So, you know, we, we just gushed over uh, five of your pieces. I'll, I'll give you the chance to to respond to any of this before we go spend some fake money in our, our last uh, segment. Yeah, no, I just want to say thank you. Like this is what as an artist you, you hope people do like people who sit and they, they look at art, they see what it looks like to them. They think deeply about it. They study it. And that's really, to me, it, it, I couldn't thank you guys enough uh, just for, for taking the time. And it's really funny and interesting to hear what people see, right? Like I've heard the sword is kind of like the calling for the one on the left. 
I haven't heard uh, uh, the skull necessarily, although that is actually the skull palette. So you could certainly be onto something there. And then uh, also the whole like anime and all that kind of stuff, because it's interesting when I look at this, I see it and I see it in different ways too. Like, so it's just amazing. Like, you know, just to be able to share this sort of thing and, and have people just, it resonates with them and they find things that, that they see that they want to share. Like, like I said, like as an artist, there's really nothing better. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I wanted to point something out that we didn't talk about before, but this, this collection really has like captivated the the community. I mean, Artoria, who's a, a friend of ours and in Grailers Dow, he, he did a contest with the Ori drip versions. So if you open up an Ori on say the open C and then you, you just wait, it, it starts dripping as you alluded to. So um, I wanted to just point that out and I'll show it on, on screen here in a second, because I think it's just a really cool feature. And the fact that you baked a lot of these different experiences, so to speak, into the work, just, you know, collectors, we really love that. And I just want to say kudos to you for, for doing that and uh, really helping engage folks uh, to the point where they are putting on contests, you know, just for the work. I, I think that's just fantastic. So, um, and, and we can see, you know, we'll come back to it. It'll, it'll keep dripping and then people will be able to see it. Uh, so perhaps our favorite segment, uh, we like to spend some fake money and see what we'd buy based on what's currently at sale. Uh, maybe I'll have Jared go first since uh, he's a seasoned pro at this. And then, then we can go to you, James, and I'll, I'll wrap it up. Jared, yeah, yeah. all of my my tabs that are open, Ori is on the permanent open tab. I'm, I'm clicking refresh constantly to see uh, the, the newly dropped pieces. So very familiar with it. Uh, if I had, what are we playing with today, P? 15. 15th? Yeah, I think it's the 15. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we had, uh, I'd scroll down to the, the 5 ETH territory and I would pick up number 89 right there, which is a beautiful um, exclusive with the purple, the purple prominence. I just think this thing is absolutely uh, stunning. I think it's, um, these exclusives don't come on the market very often. It's I've been going at it for some time. <laughs> the the seller will not lower the cost or accept any of my bids, but uh, in this fictitious world, I'm going to buy it. Um, next, we scroll back to the top. Uh, for 2.3 ETH is number 259. Are you, uh, do you have a pallet sort? Uh, yes. Apologies there. There we go. I'll take that off. That'll make more sense. So number 259 I picked because we, we kind of went over it earlier. It's one of these like uh, just the, the way the colors come together, the pops of the, the red and the, the green seems unique uh, and it, it's a very reasonable cost for entry. Then at 2.7 ETH, number 225 is one that uh, caught my attention. Um, I, I, I don't know why I love uh, the, the, this palette. I think that this one in particular zoomed in. It looks like um, just the orientation looks different than, than other pieces. It almost reminds me of like that focal type of uh, characteristic on the memories where you have this this piece that's the center. It's the colors pop appropriately off of the the black background. It just felt like a very fun um, piece that that was unique to the collection. So, uh, if my accounting is correct, that puts me at roughly fifteen ETH and or ten, excuse me, and my last. Five. I'm really debating about how to spend this because we talked about this piece earlier. It's number four twenty eight at two point two. It, it showed up in the hidden traits, um, and it's one that I've been eyeing for some time. And, and now you're giving me FOMO for not having it. Um, but that one, and then I'm gonna, I guess, somehow fake it out. But the the other one that I was considering is down at four ETH. It's number two sixty. It's a green flock. I just think the way that the flock came together on this one 
was absolutely beautiful. Um, it gives me that paper airplane vibes also how some of the folds hit the triangles um, and they're all directionally oriented. So I went a little bit over, but I'm assuming I'll be able to get a deal somewhere. So th- that's my 15 ETH. Fantastic. Fantastic. James, uh, what what did you think? How would you spend 15 fake ETH? So I was choosing other projects. Is that cool? Can I buy other people's projects or is it all worried projects? <laughs> no, no worries. Um, well, let's maybe if you if you had to, um, maybe you could talk about which worries you would like to buy. Um, only so we can keep it focused on you this time. Totally. Okay. I was totally going to drop like a reference to fake it till you make it. Cause that's like my favorite slept on project. It's not really slept on anymore, but uh, I won't do that though. I will talk about Ori Vince. No give worries. Me, how, give me one how, second. How, how about, how about I go first and then you, you could take a look. Uh, apologies for that misunderstanding. So it's, all, it's my fault. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna piggyback on a couple of Jareds. I think number eighty nine is just unbelievably cool. Just the, the you know in in a project full of like beautifully complex structures and colors, it is uh, somewhat simple. Of course, the structures are quite complex, but this purple just really hits well. So I love that one. That's a five, roughly five of my ten. I'm gonna get a deal too, though. Uh, the second one I picked is I just I love this one here, number eighty six. I mean, this one sort of feels like really like traditional origami, right? I, I see kind of a duck here or like a duck head and like a little bit of a tail. And I know I'm filling things into my mind, but I just love the way that this one came out. It felt unique to me, and it felt very like a, a central uh, object really emerged out of the complexity there. So that's another five. So I'm, I'm, I'm running out, uh, at 3.1, I would then pick up my, my skull man or, you know, what I see is my skull man, even though I I guess nobody else sees it, it turns out, (laughs) but I love this one. So I got about uh, two left. And so for my last two or so, I would pick this one up as well. uh, Number 259. And it's just, it's just beautiful. It, it's just, yeah, the, the way the colors emerged and coalesced just really strikes my eye, and I just want to keep looking at it. So uh, those are those are my three picks, or sorry, not my three, but that's how I spent fifteen ether. And James, while while you are while you're pulling that up, I am going to, uh, or while you're looking at those, I'm going to try to share one of the images. You sent to me up, uh, some of the the plotted ories. So, for folks who are listening live, you're going to have to come to the video for this. But this is a, a an image you showed of a, an ori that you plotted. This one is not multicolor. Um, we talked about potentially doing that with the plotters, and it's tough. But it's just it looks so good, man. Like I really, really enjoy these plotted. So, hoping to be able to get a hand my hands on one of those. Jared, you, yeah, these you, are going to be super. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say these are going to be super fun because uh, I rewrote the Ori algorithm to do vector outputs, and I started playing around with how to shade it. And I wrote this algorithm that uses those fold lines to change the background subtly. And the way that I create contrast is by thousands upon thousands of really really fine lines. So when you look at these up close, the detail is just like mind blowing. It's hard to describe when you're just looking at the screen, but it literally will like do solid colors and then slowly transition into a gradient of single lines. And they're really fun. They take a long time to plot uh, and I'm still tweaking it, but I'm really excited to be able to like put these out there and allow people to collect them because a large part of my story in generative art is plotter art. And like I said, with Ori is going to be something that goes beyond just the digital side of things. Uh, so beyond the animation, beyond the prints, these plots are just a different way to appreciate the project. Yeah, they look beautiful. They look beautiful. Uh, yeah, so so fake Keith, uh, no worries if you can't decide. <laughs> Yeah, so, all right, there's some that I found that aren't for sale, so we're going to just assume maybe some pricing on that, but I would buy 72. 
the 72 is just a really cool exclusified palette. It's got really good, good geometry uh, that just all works together. This one, just when it came out of the Minter, I was like, whoa. <laughs> and I still am. So I would totally scoop that up. I might have to pay more than I would uh, typically, but I would go for it. The next one would be Ori 219. Mm. This one's a zest palette, and it's really, really, really uh, degraded by the spray paint. So if you look at the bottom right, there's like some glow happening. There's a lot of drip happening. And it's got the perfect amount of it to just like completely blast the geometry in a way that that was my intention. And it just worked out really well there. Yeah, that one's got that fighter pilot look to it also, man. It just looks like a mean F-16 coming for you. <laughs> I love that. And then uh, the next one would be 222. I'd have to arm wrestle someone for this one. Uh, we brought it up a couple minutes ago, but is that? Or 221, the... sorry. There we go. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this one's certainly hangable on the wall for me. And then finally, for my last 3.3 ETH, I would buy Ori 345. Ooh, this is an interesting one. Yeah, it's a flock with really, really little tiny flocking elements. And it's also got like that band in the middle, which is really cool to me. Uh, so it's got that lighter color, like that light gray that just is right front and center. And I really just for whatever reason, like how that all comes together. So if it makes you feel any better, the, the owner of this one is a listener of the podcast and I have a conference call with them on Monday. So I'll let them know. Ah, ultra low net worth. <laughs> I don't good. know who that is, but uh, awesome. Awesome. To let them know, Jared, that James is looking for it. Uh, well, that, that that's our show, everybody. You really appreciate everybody turning in tuning in listening to us listening to james james this has been so fun man uh where can people find you where would you like to direct folks yeah thank you so much uh i would direct you to www.lostpixels.io that's my website um there's a very specific ori micro site you can click and learn more about the project there that's going to be receiving an update soon as i roll out the print and plot project, but you can go there and just read all about the inspiration to the projects and the technical stuff, check it out. Um, and then beyond that, you know, I'm certainly, I'm fully committed to wrapping up this with a couple more things and then the next big thing. So that's been kicked off and I'll be posting about that on my Twitter, which is uh, twitter.com slash to the pixel. So check me out there. Yep, and I won't show it live here because I'll probably get it wrong, but we'll we'll link to that in the show notes as well. And uh, really appreciate you coming and sharing. Everybody should definitely check out the website. We'll also link to the Hidden Traits Notion page that you created because I think that would be an excellent reference for folks too. And I just want to say uh, thank you to everybody for listening again. Jared, any parting words? One, thank you so much for coming on and sharing the insight into Ori, yourself as an artist, and B, letting the the collectorship understand the, the passion that you've put into this and some of the hidden traits that we always like to tease out. Um, it, it's absolutely an honor to have you on and to share your perspective. So thank you very much for uh, for coming in and and just doing what you do, man. You're, you're so humble. and we're grateful for all of your time. Well, thank you guys so much. You know, I really love what you're doing. I, I really love what you're doing for the community. And I think you're going great places. And it was really cool to meet you in person. And I think on that day, we were like, hey, let's do this. And that was a couple months ago. And we finally did it. it went perfect. And I really appreciate both of you. So thank you so much. No, and, and we really appreciate you and, and the fantastic art you're doing. And you know, congratulations. I didn't really say it earlier. Congratulations on going full time. As you know, Jared and I are also kind of uh, going full time. I'm full time collector's corner here. 
Jared's uh, been spinning up his eight nap fund. So the listeners check that out as well. If you're interested in digital asset, getting some exposure, uh, but yeah, just congrats on it. I know we were talking about it before and you're considering it. And I think that, uh, you know, if, if you feel any way that I do, then it probably feels really liberating and exciting, even if it is maybe not the, uh, the most clear path forward. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I think it's taking it one day at a time and sticking to the fundamentals of making really interesting, unique artwork. And that's that's all you can do, right? So that's the plan going forward. And I really think that telling stories through, you know, a transition between different mediums, like I'm really interested in that. So much more to come. It's going to be really good 2023. Well, we, we're... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jared. No, I was going to say, I'm... I'm looking forward to a the plotter pieces for Ori. I will be picking mine up, but more than that, you know, I'm looking forward to. You've come on a couple of spaces with us. You're obviously very passionate about the plotter space. I think it's a very um, greenfield opportunity, full of opportunities uh, within the space, and so I look forward to to seeing what you bring to the marketplace in regards to that. Also, um, I know it's something that you've you've had experience with in the past. And uh, I'm really excited to see what comes of it. Yeah, likewise. And I was just going to say, James, uh, you know, if this is you part time, I can't wait to see what what full time looks like. And so we're, you know, we'll have to do a round two sometime when uh, when you're ready to to share what you have next. And uh, just looking forward to continuing interacting with you in the community. We appreciate you. Yes, thank you. And I guess for everybody else. Awesome. Uh, Thanks, guys. Yeah, of course. And everybody else, thanks for tuning in. We'll be back soon with another episode doing some deep dives. We have our weekly episodes. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, follow. It helps us a lot. And uh, yeah, hope you all enjoyed this and we'll see you next time. Thank you for tuning into Collector's Corner. We really appreciate you taking the time to listen. If you like this episode and want to help us out, please subscribe and leave us a review on your podcasting platform of choice like Apple Podcasts and Spotify and follow us on YouTube. Please also follow us on Twitter for announcements as we expand to other social and content platforms. Our Twitter handle is at collectors underscore XYZ. We'd also love to hear any feedback you have. So please comment or reach out. We're always striving to be more useful and get better so we can help you in your collecting journey. The Collector's Corner team and their guests are not registered investment advisors. All views expressed on this podcast are personal opinions and are not specific inducements to make particular investments or investment strategies and should not be relied upon for investment decisions. This show is solely for informational and entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, please consult a professional.